Hey everybody, welcome to the Dad Challenge Podcast. My name is Josh, you are here from Ministry Mondays. Today's video is one I've wanted to do for a while. And it's it's I've been going back and forth about how I wanna do this because generally Ministry Mondays, I'm kind of exposing some kind of like dirty thing the church does or something like that, or I am calling out a, a behavior or some kind of thing that's going on. This is kind of gonna be a really hard one because it's kind of all those things together. Before I get started, everybody, it is really important to me that you hit that like button. I know I don't usually say that very often, but that helps the algorithm. Um, it helps people to, you know, hey, we're gonna suggest this video to you, I want you to watch it. You can like and subscribe or don't, I don't care, I usually say it at the end, but just today I'm just trying to get, uh, I'm trying to make sure that my engagement is high because I've been lazy on the engagement. And the engagement, if you support me, it really helps me when you engage by leaving a comment, a thumbs down, or thumbs up, whatever. I, it's funny, I think a lot of these drama channels don't realize when they send their people after you, um, and they engage with the channel, it's so positive. It's such a positive thing all the time. So anyway, I just wanted to say all that to say the way that you support me is to watch the commercials, um, to to engage by putting a thumbs up, um, writing a comment, even if you hate me, it's fine, uh, leaving some kind of comment. I, I tend to write back to people or give you a heart if I read it, and I read pretty much every comment that comes through because it's important for me to understand what I'm talking. I kind of want to take the pulse of the people who are listening and understanding where I'm getting it wrong, where I'm getting it right, and that kind of thing. I'm trying to grow this thing um, properly. I don't want to like cheat and do it improperly, and I don't want to like do it gross and like with tea and all that stuff, but um, I, I just think it's really important that I say that off the top. So thank you so far for, for following me on my journey. Ministry Mondays is a really, really interesting topic for a lot of people. Oh, before we get started, before we continue, this red dot, there's going to be a video coming out this week. I did a video with my good friend, Caitlin, who's going to the 2024 Olympics, hopefully. Um, she's on the path and she was punching me in the head with headgear on. So that's what you see that. And now you're going to stare at that only. So just get it out of the way. Just go for it. Just, that's yeah, fine. That's okay. No, just do it. I'm okay with it. Okay. So, um... Where was I? Anyway, so people follow this uh, church stuff because they're interested. They're interested to see the church fall, perhaps, or to see what they're doing wrong, or to be, you know, all along they knew it was this way, and so they're just kind of feeling like, okay, it's right. I, I, I am right and justified in what I do. Um, and there's going to be some videos I'm going to do in the future about what churches are doing right, but we're not there yet. I still need to deconstruct this thing, and I'm still in deconstruction mode. And today we're talking about a church called Bethel, and it's in Redding, California. And shout out to Wander with Intent. She gave me a ton of this research for me. Um, I did a ton of my research too on this one. Um, and Wander actually lives in Northern California, so she's kind of up that way. And uh, we, we discussed this a little bit, and not a lot of people know this story. And it's a story is called Wake Up Olive. And so I'm going to mess up this lady's name. So Kelly... Kaylee Heigenfall or something like that is a worship leader at Bethel. Her and her husband are worship leaders. The first thing you need to know about Bethel is they write really, really good worship music. Like, before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. Like some of the best worship songs come out of Bethel. And so I'm, I'm, I'm often torn when I talk about churches like Bethel and Elevation and Hillsong. And uh, because there's this, I think, this gross side to that church and these churches and the industry behind it. And then, but they're also writing really good music and there's really good songwriters. And I'm a musician at, by trade and I'm a worship pastor, was a worship pastor. And so I still love the music and I still feel like there's some amazing things to be had from music. So none of these bad things negate the music. I don't think and God can use anything for his glory. It doesn't matter. Right. We talk about this with Bible stories of swearing. God uses guys like Samson who murders people and bangs hookers and David who had a guy's had a girl's husband killed so he can bang her. Right. God uses anything for his glory. So that's all I say all that to say that I really love their music, but Bethel drives me up the wall for a few reasons. OK, their theology is messed. And, I, you know, there's a lot of people who like ride or die with Bethel for the theology, right? They want their theology. I'm not going to dive so crazily heavily into theology, except to say a few things like they believe in things like glory clouds, gold dust, angel feathers, and things like that happen inside of their auditoriums and their sanctuaries specifically. And like more of like a, you, you'd find them more along the lines of a Pentecostal style church where it's just really, really engaging. They are very spiritual. They feel like God has blessed them in a way that they can like do big things and they have the, the gold dust and the angel feathers and like people getting gold fillings and they do grave soaking and they do some crazy things that people would, and for good reason, think that they're nuts for doing. And, but they're very public. One of the largest movements of church in the U S right now, uh, especially specifically when it comes to the worship music scene, which I'm plugged into, they are one of the main, uh, influencers in worship, like of the four it's Hillsong, Bethel, Elevation. Um, is there any more? I mean, there's a few passion, 
but they're up there with the big guns, right? They make a lot of money in their music, millions, but they write some good, good music. So anyway, this whole story stems from Bethel's theology too, right? So if you go to Bethel, and I had a friend of mine, I'm trying to get her on the show. We've been going back and forth. She went to their school of supernatural worship, whatever they call it. Um, stop calling it that anyway. It's weird to call it a supernatural school of worship. It just feels like, really? That's what you're going to call this? And then you had a meeting and then the table like, okay, let's come up with a name for the school where we're going to charge a bunch of money. People come out to see how we worship. Here, I got an idea. Supernatural school of music. Yeah, that sounds great. I would be like, the other guy in the, in the table would be like, really you guys not just okay i mean just bethel school of music would have worked but you know do the supernatural thing cool i get it you want to draw people because they feel like supernatural is kind of where their church sits like they feel like you gotta understand what a glory cloud is it's literally a cloud of god coming down ascending onto the stage and people are falling over and they're crying and worshiping and speaking in tongues and spitting and laughing and doing all these crazy things you see some of these um worship things that they have um, it, it gets a little bit creepy if you don't understand what's going on. If you're, if you've invited someone out to like a Bethel event like this and they're not a Christian guaranteed, they're not coming back. They're going to be like, this is a cult. It's very cultish feeling. So a lot of it is based in scripture though. Okay. I just, I want to say that, like, I don't think that Bethel is a cult. I don't think that they're anti Jesus or that they're super heretical, let's say, because everybody has their beliefs. And again, I'm going to land right here and tell you every time that it really doesn't matter what you believe. As long as you believe in Jesus, in the end, it's about the thief on the cross. Remember the guy, he says, I'm sorry. And Jesus says, you'll be with me just like that. It's a matter what you believe. Your theology doesn't really matter. Like Benny Hinn, Joel Osteen, you know, all these dirt bags out there who are raking money from people. I, I, if they genuinely believe in Jesus, they're good to go. So you say for what it is. And there's a lot of people who will call it heretics and do all these things and call them whatever they want. But in the end, it's really about your heart. I believe even like, you know, Mormons, Catholics, everybody who doesn't you know, fall in the same kind of like evangelical line. If you believe in Jesus, it's why I believe if you believe in Jesus and who he said he was in the resurrection, you're good to go. It's all that matters. Anyway, you don't even have to crack open a Bible if you don't want to. All that to say that. So Bethel has this theology where they do some crazy things. So one day we will get into the gold dust and the gold and the angel feathers and the glory clouds and the grave soaking and all stuff. But I just, I say all those things to say that they just, they have a really different way of looking at their faith and the way that they run their church. And there's actually a guy down in California doing worship nights, um, that are, he's saying, you know, if they're, if BLM and everybody's allowed to protest and do all those things, well, we're going to have our peaceful protest and they're going to worship. And they kind of got a point, but he's, he's running this movement that's kind of anti-mask and anti-science and, um, all this stuff about COVID. And, and we can argue all day long about Bethel, who is a church that that believes in healing, believes that they heal people. And if you watch American gospel, they dive a little bit into that. You know, you got a guy like Bill Johnson, who's their pastor. Um, and they, and I'm like, it's, it's, it's funny that how Bethel is eerily silent though on COVID. Why are they not out there healing all the COVID patients? Anyway, we can go on that all day long because healing, I do believe exists. I think it's a thing. I just don't think it exists at your whim. Like, and it's only, and if it's the thing, why does it only happen at certain churches? It's always a certain church that does it. I don't feel like, I feel like that's kind of anti-God where it's not like, it's like God is only going to favor Bethel by doing all those things there because they have the faith for it. It's just, it doesn't, it, it, the way the world works today is not the way it was in the Bible. And so we're going to dive into that because it's about resurrection. The story is about resurrection and resurrection is when you bring someone back from the dead. Now there are stories all over the world where this happened. There's biblical stories for it. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Jesus raised people from the dead. Jesus himself was raised from the dead. This is a thing. If you believe in what I believe, right? So this is biblical base for being raised from the dead. So we will stay there. Have I ever seen it? No. Are there stories? I'm sure there are stories, but there's no, I don't think there's any documented proof so far medically anyway, as, as it pertains to it. I know that people have been, that have died and come back. Like there's a girl that's coming on the multi-channel network and she's really cool. And she died three times. And she's, she's now going to start a YouTube channel and she's now going to start a YouTube channel. So that's cool. But what we're talking about here is actual resurrection of someone who's been dead. Like Lazarus was dead for four days and he came back. And so let's get to the point. So we get to Ke uh, Kelly Heigenthal, Heigenthal, uh, Heigenthal. I don't know how to say their name and I apologize, but I want to land here as a parent. So this is going to be two parts. I'm a parent and I'm a believer, right? I'm ex-pastor and I understand a little bit of theology and I understand a little bit of the Bible. I'm not saying I'm a biblical scholar by any means. I'm not, um, but it's really easy to look this kind of stuff up. And so Kaylee and her husband are worship leaders at Bethel. And again, one of the biggest churches in the world. Worship is one of their main attractors. Okay. Uh, a lot of people don't even know who the main pastor is. It's about the music for a lot of people. Okay. And they probably get paid quite a bit. Because you work at these churches and you're pretty famous. You're famous. You're an influencer. You're famous. Like there's a world of idolatry for worship pastors and these people are part of that. And they write great music and they're great, very talented people. They always wear dumb hats. Um, but the saddest part about this as a parent is that their daughter um, 
Olive died. So she, I think it was SIDS. So uh, sudden infant death syndrome, they just stopped breathing and then had passed away. They found her. And as a parent, I want to land right here for a second, because before I get on, I don't want everybody to be like ratioing me about how insensitive I am about this topic, because in the end, if that ever happened to my kid, I would do exactly what they did. So I want to preface that by saying I would definitely appeal to God. I would definitely be angry. I would definitely be shouting. I would definitely be tweeting. I would definitely be doing everything I could if I knew that there was a little bit of hope that this could be it. Now, I don't know what I would do because I've never grieved like that and I don't ever want to. And I don't ever want, I would never wish that on anybody. And so this isn't a, this isn't a video jabbing them and saying how bad they are. Um, there is going to be some heavy, hard questions to answer though for these types of, for these parents. Okay. Um, but I want to land right here that this is the worst thing that could ever happen to a parent. I can't, I can't even imagine. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Like, this is probably, I know some people out there are known who have had children die and it's just, I, I don't, it's almost like you want to separate yourself and not even think about it because it's, I often will, my mind will wander when I'm driving and I'll think to myself what happened. And I have a really, really crazy imagination. And like, I, I get, it gives me anxiety to think about it. I know I want my kids to be healthy and live forever. I want to, I want my kids to outlive me. And I, so whenever that happens, it's the craziest thing ever. So Olive dies. And then the thing that happens is that Bethel starts this campaign. So she writes this post after Olive dies and they came up with a statement that says one of the worship leaders kids have died. And then, so Kaylee, Kaylee writes this in her Instagram post. She says, we're asking for prayer. We believe in a Jesus who died and conclusively defeated every grave, holding the keys to resurrection power, right? We need it for our little Olive Aileen who stopped breathing yesterday and has been pronounced dead by doctors. We're asking for bold, unified prayers from the global church to stand with us in belief that he will raise this little girl back to her life. Her time here is not done. And it is our time to believe boldly and with confidence and with confidence wield what King Jesus paid for. It's time for her to come to life. So it's, it's, it's a powerful statement. First of all, right there. And again, as a parent, I, if I, I mean, I would try everything in my absolute power to bring my little girl back to life. I would, I would be right where she is. So I want to say that, but there's a couple of troubling things that are happening here. And this is where a lot of people have some problems. I'm not necessarily one that has a problem with this, but a lot of people were calling her out for using her global platform with her 250,000 followers on Instagram to call for this little prayer, global prayer for her daughter. Okay. And what a lot of people have a problem with is that there's a million trillion kids that die a day, right? There's just, everybody's dying every day. And she got to use her global platform to rally churches to pray for her daughter. And a lot of people were like, well, why don't you do this for when someone, like, cause I'm sure that Bethel has had people inside their church um, that have had children who have died because they're a very big church and this has never happened. And I actually believe that there are tweets out there that say, that state that exact thing that some kids inside that church have died, but they didn't get to use their platform to do this. They didn't do this is what I'm saying. And so she used her platform to, to launch this campaign. And so that was one of the big issues. It was like, okay, but you know what? If I had that power, I'd do it too. So let's not pretend you wouldn't do it. But the issue is, is that she's a leader of this church. She gets paid to be there and she's a spiritual influencer and advisor and a worship leader. And so the fact that there were probably people that go to that church that didn't get offered the same platform to lobby God to do what they wanted can be construed as, you know, that's not, that's not cool. Right. So, but again, I'm not going to blame her for that. And then this church, uh, put it on their sign, uh, covenant community warriors, which is that's weird that they have a church with a football logo. America, you guys it says covenant CCS, CCS, I guess it's a school. So it's a covenant community school. Okay. That's why. Okay. We are still standing in faith for all of her family. We're asking our friends and family for the faith to pray, to declare life over her. We were reminded of Lazarus in John 11. Lazarus come from that tomb. Okay. We serve the resurrected King. So, What's, what's happening here is they're, they're saying, well, Jesus did it for Lazarus. Can we just stop here for a second and say, yep, Jesus raised people from the dead. Jesus is not here anymore. Okay. It's, it's this, this confidence thing that says, look, Jesus did it so we can do it. To me, that is cocky. Okay. That's to me, that is like, really? I'm not Jesus. I'm not going to claim the power of Jesus. I'm not going to say I could do the things Jesus did. I can, do, I can say things in faith. To say, God, I'd love for you to do these things. And faith, you know, they say in the Bible, you're the faith of a mustard seed can move a mountain. Like real true faith can do big things. And I do believe that. I just believe that none of us have that ability. I just don't think we, in the world we live in right now, the faith that a lot of us have is just not powerful enough to do what we want it to do. And I, that could mean a lot of things. I don't know. But what it means is that that's kind of cocky is what I'm saying. It's like, oh, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So he can, he's going to, and that's kind of what they're basing this on. They're saying, well, Jesus did it for Lazarus. So we, we know that it happened. So God, you have to do this for all of now. Basically that's, it's this, it's, I know that they're not 
truly saying, oh, you're doing this. But it's to the world, it sounds like that's what they're saying. It sounds like they're being very, God, do this. They're saying, they're declaring it and not asking or humbling themselves for it. Does that make sense? So they're not really saying, oh, please, it's more like you are. And there's a difference in the language there. So she goes on to read this. She goes on for the next week. She says, day, I don't know where day two went. Um, anyway, it says, day three is a really good day for resurrection. We are overwhelmed with gratitude by, our outpouring of, by your outpouring of love for us and faith for Olive. Again, faith for Olive. It's not faith for Olive. It's faith for Jesus. Anyway, Jesus is faithful and true, and he's riding in with the victory he bought for Olive. Olive Aileen means victorious awakening. We call in the mighty, all-sufficient name of Jesus, and we call you back by and we call you back by name, sweet girl. You will live. Thank you for your faith-filled de declarations. Keep them coming. Worship Jesus with us. He is moving. He is good. He is worthy. He's alive. Let's land right there. You will live. This is what I'm saying. These declarative statements, although are are from a passionate mother who has had a child that has died, which I couldn't understand. But the point that you're missing, and this is the point that really sucks, this is the point that really hurts, is that you have this public platform of a church that is very public. You have 250,000 followers on Instagram, which is crazy. You're a worship leader. You're not, you know what I mean? And a lot of them, they live their life and then they make a lot of money doing this stuff. So what you're doing is you're declaring something and you're saying you will live. You are declaring that it's happening. You are telling God that this has to happen. You're almost putting it on God. If you don't do this, look at how many people are following me. And if you don't do this, like you're going to discredit yourself. She's, she's using her influence on social media. This is so weird to lobby God, to do what she wants him to do. And again, let's, I would do it too. Anything to bring your daughter back. I, I agree. But I just feel like we got to talk about this from the outside perspective, because how many people want to see the church fall? How many people are watching, but there's Facebook groups out there that are against Bethel in big ways. Okay. Thousands of members who are trying to get them done because they don't they think they're heretics. And these aren't atheists. These aren't agnostic people. They're Christians who want Bethel brought down because of the lies that they might've been telling or the, the, the fake path that people have been going down. But we'll talk about that another day. Cause I, I really, I mean, as long as the path leads to Jesus, I don't care how you get there. So again, I just wanted to say that it's a declarative statement, meaning that they are confident that it's going to happen. Okay. And this is day three, little Olive is sitting in the morgue day three. Okay. Then it says, Carrie Joby, who's one of the most prolific female worship leaders in the world, probably the most and the wealthiest, probably worship leader, one of the wealthiest worship leaders in general, very, very talented, very powerful singer. Um, I remember going to a conference and like, there's no way you could talk to her. She's a rock star, right? She's famous. In the world of Christianity, we're going to talk about this another day. Famous Christians, we have to talk about famous Christians. It should not be a thing. Anyway, I mean, famous Christians for being Christian, not like people who are like Chris Pratt, who's a Christian. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who use their platform to become famous as Christians. Anyway, so this is what Carrie Joby says. We are still standing in faith for Olive to wake up. Rita Springer Post says it's so powerful and wisely. Thousands are contending in prayer right now for Olive. What we're asking for is supernatural. The belief for life to come into what is dead and not what many would feel normal. But if you have a relationship with God of scripture, then you have set yourself in a family of the new normal. Call it crazy, but here's the wild thing about faith. If you get God in your, into your veins, everything that once felt normal starts to feel like an excuse to stay safe. And faith or belief in God ages in us. It gets older in us when you carry it for years. It grows deep in the roots of maturity and no longer sits in religious walls and judges what it can be. She's right there. No longer sits in religious walls. I like that point. But... Again, I just want to outline that Carrie Joby is Matt. Let's see how many followers Carrie Joby has. So she's got 1.3 million followers on Instagram. So I, I'm going to go back to this platform thing. If you're going to do this for Kaylee, you got it. You really should do this for everybody in church. Then it, it, it bothers a lot of people because they didn't because they just did it for this privileged person of power inside of the church. And that speaks a lot of the church, not just Kaylee and everything that Bethel, but it speaks a lot of like how pastors get more of, you know, benefit of the doubt, they get more money, they get more, you know, they don't get more grace. Unfortunately, they, they get judged harsher, but they, they, there's this, there's this thing about Christian privilege that exists inside this community of, of modern church. Okay. There's famous Christians. They have tons of privilege. They get to do a lot of things. They have this power and things over people. They are worshiped. They are, they are idol. They are idols for people. And so this is a world that is really, really weird to be honest with you. And so using your platform to get people to pray for your, for your daughter, again, I'm not saying I, I wouldn't do it. I probably would, but that's what speaks volumes here. A lot of, uh, tweets, you know, yes, all of wake up little girl praying for declaring life over all of, we believe the miracle praying right now. Won't stop Lord. You know, uh, Pat Barrett says, Kaylee, the Barrett's are praying. Jesus help. You know, a lot of check marks are praying. They're all praying. 
here's the thing. These, this is going out viral, guys. This isn't just like everybody's seeing this and everybody's now watching this. This became a national news story, okay? And so now this is where it gets, where there, it almost feels like Bethel and Kaylee and everybody was like, okay, God, we've got this message out there. God has to do this. God, it's almost like, God, we've done this. You had to do it now. It's on you now. And God, can I hear me out on this? God is like so far removed from any of that stuff that it's just like, I feel like he, he, he grieves and cries and the plan is set in place and nobody dies. You know, uh, we're going to go back to Bill Johnson's message in a minute, but like God has a plan for people, right? But on earth things happen because of free will. Okay. God doesn't smite people and kill them like that. I mean, in the old Testament he did. Um, but here it's just, it's a different world. Evil exists, you know, disaster exists. Um, health issues exist like SIDS and everything else. It's not just God snapping his fingers and you're dead. Okay. Um, I'm not saying that God doesn't intervene where he needs to intervene and he can, he can, and he has, and I do believe that. But I feel like when you, when you put pressure on God here, where this is almost like God show yourself like atheists and people who hate God and who hate religion and who doesn't believe he exists are like, well, if he, if he, if he's, if he's real, prove your, prove yourself to me. How many people have yelled out, you know, prove, I will believe if you do this thing for me. You know, if I, if you can help me pay my rent this month, I will believe in you forever. If you help me get through this thing, I'll believe in you forever. It's such a weird psychology of humans to believe in, in this type of thing where it's like, I'll, you know, if you show yourself to me, but th this is why faith is important. And a lot of people are like, well, why do you believe what you believe? You know, a lot of really brilliant people believe in God. I'm not saying I'm brilliant. I'm just saying I'm not dumb. Okay. And you believe what you believe because there's something different. There's a human connection. There's like a soul thing. And I always, I said last time I was wrestling with this idea that if there's a hell and I believe that hell is actually the absolute absence of God. And when you're feeling super lonely, you've been let down or those moments in your life, you've been devastated, that feeling you get that just like that, just absolute emptiness of feeling. I feel like that's the closest you're going to get to the feeling of no God because God is everywhere. Okay. And so I say all that to say that it's lobbying. God is not going to get you anywhere. God does not do the will of a human being. Okay. It's completely opposite. We do the will of God. We will say, if it's your will, we'll do it. If it's your will to raise all of, then let it be, right? Not you will rise from the dead. There's a big declarative difference here, okay? Where you're saying, you are literally thinking that you can use Instagram to lobby God. <laughs> to me, that is that is crazy. Like, yeah, you're an influencer in the world, but to God, you, you're loved just like everybody else. You're the same as everybody else. You're not, no one is more powerful on earth to God than the next person. Like me next to someone like Trump, we're the same in God's eyes. We are the same person just because on earth you're a different power and everything else. It's we're the same. So it just felt I, cocky is the wrong word. It just felt like, cause, cause of the theology that is built into them at Bethel, that this is kind of their, this is where they live. This is their language. This is what they believe because it's what they're taught by Bill Johnson. And so let's dig into the Bill Johnson um, thing that he had to come out with during this whole thing, because it blew up. And it started a fiery conversation on Twitter and Instagram and everywhere else. And she was getting ratioed. And, and here, and the thing is, there was no reason for anybody to hate on this person ever. She lost a daughter. Okay. And I, and again, let's not, let's not, let's not kid ourselves that we wouldn't do the same thing if one of our kids died. Okay. So let's just land there. And she was getting ratioed and hurt and hated. And Bethel was already in hot water because of their theology anyway. And so this just exasperated it. And they were... You know, imagine that God did raise this girl from the dead. What would have happened? Like world changing. And to me, that speaks more volumes about God than it does about anything else. That God is like, look, I'm not going to be tested. Don't test me. It's just not what I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you need to believe. I'm not going to show you to believe you need to. God doesn't want you to force you to believe in him. He wants you to do it yourself. And that's the point of free will. If you want you to love, you can do it. He could just snap his fingers and you would be perfect, but he wants you to want it. So we have to get into the I did this whole next thing, which is the Heiligenthal family GoFundMe, which is at $78,000. And at first, a lot of people were asking, why are you raising 100000 bucks for uh, a family of a church? And so I get it, right? Funeral costs and all that kind of stuff. But this, this again, screams this whole inner workings of this white Christian modern church privilege that these people enjoy thoroughly by this massive audience who worship them. This is, I think at the core of all this is this idea of worshiping worship leaders and pastors that they are like revered because they play music or they are in public eye in the back end. Like I was this guy, I was a pastor here. I was, a, I was a influencer pastor in my community. I was probably the one that everybody came to for how I was doing things and all that stuff. And so, and I was nothing, but I had a little bit of the influence and I felt it. And these people live normal. They're normal. 
And when they come, a lot of these people get called out too for the way that they live their lives and in the back end. And you, if you ever ask a person who toured with some of these big bands like Bethel and Hillsong and Elevation, you actually would be very, very surprised at what you see and what you hear. And I've actually, I know a guy who toured with them and not with Bethel, with another large group and was like, I couldn't believe it. I could, how, how opposite they are. I'm not saying that they are. I'm just saying there's this world of church white privilege that exists in these leaders who are influential. The fashion, they get paid for it. The music they write, the writers that they hire, the studios they go, the money they make, the touring that they do, their Instagram tweet that everybody's ingesting, right? It's different if you're an Instagram influencer, they're showing your ass or whatever, say whatever you want, right? But Christian influencers need to be really, really, really careful with their platforms. That's all I'm going to say about that. But so they raised this money. A lot of people were questioning, what was this money for? Initially, I heard this and this could be, this is conjecture. I don't know if this is true, that they were raising money for post-resurrection fees. I'm not kidding. What it costs to bring someone back from the dead. So like, you know, there's fees for documents and like, you know, you have to take some a time off to go to Hawaii and take a break and go for a family vacation and all this stuff and um, all that stuff. I'm not saying that they don't deserve it. And any family that's going through struggles, throw as much money as you can at them, pay, give them as much as you can possibly get them so they can get through a couple of years. I'm, I'm all for it. I want to just say this, though. These people were already probably pretty wealthy. You work for a church like this. This church has an annual budget of 60 million dollars. As, and I don't even think that has anything to do with their music, their royalties and things that come in. Because imagine this. On any given Sunday, a Bethel song is definitely being played at over, I want to say, 25,000 churches. And I'm just making these numbers up, but it's based on my own. I know that in the U.S. there's, I don't know, 100,000 churches. I don't know. I, I can do more numbers. I'm just saying. Let's just take this for example. There's 100,000 churches playing one Bethel song every Sunday. They get paid every time that song gets played by CCLI. Okay, CCLI takes fees from churches. If you project lyrics, if you play the song, if you use the tracks, that artist gets paid. Bethel gets paid. Okay, they make a lot of money. Why didn't just Bethel help them? They have more money than they ever know what to do with. They have so much, $60 million a year to run an annual budget. Why are they doing GoFundMe? That there again, this is why people are getting so upset because there's poor people that reside in Bethel Church. Poor people who've had kids who have died. Poor people who are still poor. And they're raising money for already wealthy people who are already influential, who tour, who live their life as rock stars, who enjoy like all this is, you know, what they make their money. They write music and they perform music. And that is my dream. So I'm jealous. But I'm saying that is a dream job of dream jobs. They don't do anything otherwise. They don't even do the back end. They don't write chord charts. They don't do pro presenter. They don't do any of the administrators. They probably have full time administrators. They literally are rock stars. They walk in with their skinny jeans and their weird hats. They write tunes for hours. They play them on Sunday. They are idolized. They walk off and they live their lives and they make a lot of money. It is definitely a video I'm doing soon. It is very weird culture that we live in and that we, we, we hold these people up as idols. That GoFundMe sits with me wrong because I know that Bethel could have afforded it. And so they should have not, they should, Bethel should have stepped forward and said, hey, take, take that down. We are going to help them, whatever it costs to send them away to help them. We're going to give them a year off to grieve. We're going to pay all their salaries. We're going to give Bethel could have done it. Bethel did nothing about it. So that screams a little bit icky to me. That's all I'm saying. GoFundMe's are awesome. I'm just saying when you already have a ton of money, it hits me a little bit weird. So we're up to this point and Bill Johnson had to come out and obviously do this political optic stunt where he's like, okay, well, it's probably not gonna happen. So I gotta come out and say, this is not gonna happen. So the fallout happens after Olive obviously does not raise from the dead, right? Olive has passed away, they do her funeral and Bethel kind of goes a little bit eerily silent on the whole thing. It's just weird that they had this massive movement and it doesn't happen and parents are just, okay, they're heartbroken. First of all, let's just, of course. But then there's this fallout and you got to know as a parent and as somebody who's a leader of a mega church, a massive influential church, uh oh, what have I done? For me as a leader, if that ever happened to me, not only would I be heartbroken, my kid did not get raised from the dead. Of course, I would be devastated. But at the same time, now I have to answer to everybody who was like, are you crazy? And that is one of the, this is the, the hardest part of this whole story is that she believed this stuff. I don't believe that she didn't believe it. I honestly truly believe in her heart. She definitely believed this. And that's going to go back to the idea of Bethel itself and the theology that it spouts to everybody that goes there. It's very cultish in a way. And if you go to the supernatural, there's a lot of people out there who, who whistleblow on this church a lot, but the, the stuff that they're doing, because in the end, there's no reason to do, to have bad theology. There's no reason to do all this stuff and except to, to be, to make yourself feel good. It's just almost like wealth and prosperity ministries. There's just nothing 
that benefits from this. Nobody benefits from lies, especially when you're throwing gold dust through your HVAC system, okay, and fake feathers and all this stuff. Nobody benefits from that. It actually makes it worse. So I'm going through Kaylee's Instagram. Day five is a really good day for resurrection. I've never been more grateful for Jesus. He is endlessly worthy of our trust, love, faith, and risk, right? So she's saying she's risking it. And that's day five. This kid has not been buried. There's, they're, they're not having any plans to have a funeral. They're so confident this is going to happen. So Lazarus was four days, let's say there. Then her next post was, so that was on Dece December 18th. And then her next post was 10 days later. So there's a 10 day period here where they had to kind of come to the terms that God was not going to raise, even though you were so confident that he was going to do it. And that's heartbreaking in two ways. You lost a kid. You probably lost a little bit of faith in Jesus, even though that the, the stuff that's been built into you by your church has, is the one that let you down, not Jesus. And so there's got to be some wrestling there. There's got to be some anger on, and for good reason, justifiable anger at God. Look, it's not a sin to be angry at God, everybody. It's really not. You can be angry, you can swear, you can yell, you can scream, you can show them, you can hate them. You are human. And so something, the hardest part about this whole story is at this point where she's, now she has to deal with everybody. God is in her mind, probably let her down and her church. She's let her church down in the whole world of the community of people that spread this for her. And now she's in this terrible position all around. She's been in a rock hard place, fiery pits and, you know, a, a big pile of raisins. She's not in a place where she can go anywhere without being, without either hating herself or being, thinking that she let herself down. That's really hard. So 10 days later, she writes, all of we miss you, love you so much, and we'll see you soon. We know more than ever that Jesus is good and his every word is worth believing and following at any cost. That's the song we'll sing until we're with you again. And we finally sing it together. We cannot wait. There's a new day and we're awake for it. This is a victory story. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's not a victory story. No, the only victory that happened here is that Olive gets to go with Jesus. Okay, so we're going to get to that in a second. But just saying those things, you just it's really hard for people to, when you say something like that, this is a victory story. When you were so sure it was going to happen, all of a sudden you go silent for 10 days and then sit. And the next post is about, she just goes on, she's grieving, finally gets to grieve. Part of this is that a church theology has built into this woman something where she didn't actually get to grieve and she believed something was going to happen and she had to double grieve. Like that's hard. And let's not forget, she got a little sister that doesn't grow up with a sister. So this is a heartbreaking story all around. And so I just, I, more, more, I'm, more I'm, not, I'm not even angry at Kaylee. I would never, ever be. I'm not angry at the situation uh, of what happened or the, uh, the father. Um, uh, I'm, what I'm angry at about the situation is this, this perpetuation of like a pastor says something and you effing believe it. This is a pastor, Bill Johnson, guys who believes the things he's saying and he tells all of his followers and let's not, they're not Jesus followers. They're Bill Johnson followers. They're Bethel followers. They worship him. They worship the music. They worship the production. They're very good at it. They hire the best in the world. Like churches like this, like the church I came from too, they all have a language that they speak. They all have like a culture that they live in and they all live it. It's almost like being working at Apple or Google, all these people. And you know where the churches get these ideas to do these things from Apple, from Google, from Disney, they learn how to do corporate world and they build it into their churches. And then some churches become so good at it that corporate worlds go to churches to learn how they do it. Okay. So they have this whole aura and everything. So when this guy's preaching all these things, he's out there and people are believing him and his the people that follow him that he pays to follow him and to do all the things for him. They're listening to hang on in every word he says. And so that puts you in a position like this. One of the other big arguments I'm going to, I know we're getting really long is that this idea that why would you bring all of back everybody? She's with Jesus. And so I saw a lot of tweets saying, how dare you? How dare you? Because it's selfish is what they're saying. It's selfish for this mother to say, and especially because what she believes, she believes if she believes Jesus, who he says he is and the heaven is real, then why would you want to bring someone back from that? Heaven will be like, it is everything you're going to think it's going to be at times a trillion for eternity. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be a place where you are with God. If you believe what I believe. Okay. So why would you want to bring someone back from that for your own, I guess. And again, as a parent, I get it. I do get it. And so a lot of people were saying that, and, and this is the part that pissed me off too, because it's easy for you to say that. It really is easy for you to say that because you haven't lost a child, but they're kind of right. So that's a rock and a hard place for a lot of people to argue. 
is that, yeah, I would want my kid back here with me because I'm being, I, I, I will admit I would be selfish about that. But imagine a kid being heaven for five days, six days, and then all of a sudden you're back. It's just a lot of people couldn't square that. They're like, why would you want to bring her back from that? So that's another big, you know, just a, a fleeting thought that doesn't really deserve a lot of, you know, conversation, but it is there for your to, for you to, to munch on. But let's not forget at the end, there's a mother here that didn't really get to grieve because she was she was taught to believe that she could petition God with her major social media platform and all her friends who had major social media platforms and her privilege in her church that allowed her to give her a platform to do this and then went along with her for this and then the whole world watched it and the whole world watched it not happen. At the core here, there's a disconnect. And so when Bethel comes out and says, we, we are the ones who perform the miracles, we're the ones who do this, we're the ones who can heal, we're the ones who have the angel dust and the cloud of glory and the, and the grave soaking and all these crazy weird things. It's just, it, 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 it doesn't, you can't square it because why does it only happen at one place? Or like, why does it only happen with, why do people speak in tongues only at Pentecostal churches? Why does it only happen at certain places? And it's always that place, like Benny Hinn and all these people, like these people are, all, it's fake to me. That's what I'm saying. It's fake. I mean, there are genuine things that happen in the world, I do believe. I don't think they happen at these mega churches that have TV cameras on. I think they happen in with missionaries in like Africa, where you're never going to see it or have proof for it. They need there to be proof for it because they're building their whole platform and they make a lot of money off this platform. They pay a lot of people, these churches, these worship leaders make a lot of money and they're doing GoFundMe for, to send them to Hawaii for vacations when they could have just paid out of their pocket like that. With, and it would have been a, a, a minuscule drop in the bucket of their budget. Okay, one one hundred thousand dollars of a sixty million dollar budget. That's like me giving my kid a dollar to go to get something at Seven Eleven. Okay, it's nothing. And where do they spend this money? It's a nonprofit organization. Sixty million dollars. All that to say, this wake up all the story was really heartbreaking, and it was. We need to separate the, the the mother's grief from the whole situation because I believe that she's been taught to believe this, and there's been a lot of people waking up from Bethel these days. A lot of people calling out and doing a ton of stuff and just saying they're waking up to it. Anyway, so that's another whole video and I'm not going to stop talking about Bethel. There's some crazy things I want to talk about with Bethel. So, you know, if you want to dig more into the story, there's a lot more to it than I've given you, but this wake up all the story was heartbreaking on, a lot, on so many levels, but it was one of those big ones that talks about churches and their theology and how damaging it could be to the people who serve there and believe it and drink the Kool-Aid and to the people around them watching for them to fail because they want you to fail. And then they did. And then people blame God when it's actually bad theology. So like and subscribe or don't, whatever. This has been a crazy video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, you know, if you have any questions about this type of stuff, I'm always there to answer. Um, I'm, again, I'm not a theology, you know, professor. I don't, I'm not a biblical scholar. I do know what I know. I've studied a little bit and I, I do understand my theology. I know what I believe anyways, if that's what you're asking. I know what I believe. And I do believe that it is shifting too. So, whew. That's crazy. So I hope you guys have an amazing Monday and I will see you probably tomorrow for something else. Um, not as deep as this and crazy, but what a crazy story. What a crazy story.